Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. It's been a minute since uh, I think we were last year for the 2020 European Championships uh, at the end of last year, one of those last qualifying events. But we're back. We have supposedly a bouldering season to talk about. Maybe not a lead season, maybe not a speed season. We'll have to see how it goes. But it's also the year of the 2020 Olympics. For, I don't know why we're still calling it the 2020 Olympics, but branding, you know. So anyway, <laughs> we're back. My name's Tyler Norton, uh, as always. And of course, uh, the uh, recurring guest host, John Bergman, uh, writer for all um, all the climbing publications and author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. We've even got a picture. Look at that. Nice. Uh, before we get into it, uh, Maringen is right around the corner and that's why we're talking today. So finally, an IFSC Bouldering World Cup. Of course, you can join us in the Plastic Weekly Discord server. Uh, the link is in the description below. That's where we do some voice chat or text chat during the events because the IFSC doesn't run the YouTube text chat. So it's nice to talk to people. And we're not ridiculous people that spend the whole time talking about whether or not they're wearing masks or whatever. We're actually talking about the climbing and the events and whether or not you know rules are stupid or this, that, the wall design, whatever. So if you like talking about real climbing, Come hang out in the Discord, and we'll be uh, we'll be watching the uh, Maringen World Cup uh, with a bunch of like-minded people. But anyway, uh, John, just as a, a quick checkup, you're still alive. Are, are you guys still in lockdown where you are? Things are starting to open up here. Um, actually, they've been open for a little while. It's it seems like um, you know every week seems to be a little better. Although I am a little reluctant to say that because I know that various areas of the United States have had spikes, you know, um, Michigan, you know, kind of here one. and there, <laughs> but yeah, so it, but you know, it's, um, I mean, at this point we're just kind of doing the dance that everybody's used to at this point after the whole 12 or 13 months or whatever it's been. Um, but yeah, things are open. So, cool. um, we had the, the national team trials were a week or so ago for USA climbing. So comp climbing is, is kind of coming back. It seems like, yeah. so that's cool. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's think back to a time before contagious diseases. Let's go back to 2019. We were, it were maybe like the most excitement around a season in a long time for various reasons. Talk about Maringen. maringen has been, I think, the season opener since 2016 now, if I remember right. Um, it kind of replaced Grindelwald. So you were mentioning in a text chat earlier that Maringen just like always delivers every year. It is a banger of a competition. 2017 had that weird situation uh, uh, with Flow Sports was going to take over the streaming, which uh, Eddie Falk mentioned in a recent post. I, that was one of the few World Cups I've actually been to. And it was it was amazing to be there for that moment because I was not aware of there was going to be a protest during the opening ceremonies. But uh, that was a really interesting weekend. 2017 was uh, uh, or, sorry, that was 2017. 2018 was uh, Yerne Cruder's first win, as you mentioned. And of course, 2019, the infamous hand crack. And, you know, not the part we talk about, but any bouldering World Cup where the person wins the competition on, you know, a flash attempt of the final problem, last guy out, it was like the perfect bouldering competition. So Maringen always delivers. Uh, but going back to uh, to uh, 2019, again, that hand crack, and then the season was swept by Yanya Garnbrett, which at the start of the season, Yanya Garnbrett was you know, one of the legendary lead climbers and a great bouldering, you know, athlete, but she had never won a bouldering season. I don't even remember if she had like, like even gotten them on the podium of a bouldering season. I'd have to double check. Um, so it, it was an incredible year for climbing. Of course, speed climbing, the women broke world records twice within the World Cup season. Uh, in lead, you had the breakout of Chai and So and all these other young climbers that came up. Ai Mori, Yu Tang Zhang, uh, or Yu Tong Zhang, sorry. Um, it, there was so much to talk about at every single event and uh, there was so much hope for what was going to happen in the next year. You know, we were qualifying those athletes and then uh, as it turns out, early 2020, things took a, a turn. So I kind of wanted to to ask you first, like, do you remember what your expectations were for 2020, um, you know, a year ago as we were about to come into uh, uh, the season, but then things started to turn sour? Like, what were you looking forward to at that point? It's interesting to go back in time, uh, and and because all it's like 2019 and 2020, I think for a lot of people, kind of run together <laughs> in a little bit, you know, because this past year has been so weird. But it is interesting to go back to March or April of of 2020 and try to remember what we were looking forward to when we still thought there would be a 2020 bouldering season. Um, certainly, 
as you kind of mentioned, you know, Yanya had such a phenomenal, I mean, to say the least, like a phenomenal bouldering season in 2019. So I think one of the biggest expectations or anticipations for a lot of people was what is she going to do in the bouldering season for 2020? That that was the big question for, for you and myself and a lot of people. We were really looking forward to that. Um, and I don't think that's any different than this current season, as we'll get into in a second. But aside from the Yanya stuff, Going into 2020, I think there were a few things that I was really curious about. One of them, just to speak a, briefly about about um, the American scene here, is if if you recall, if people recall the the 2020 Pan American Championships, right before uh, everything fell apart, yeah. That's right. Yeah, the bouldering portion for that. Let's we won't since we're just talking about the bouldering season, we'll we'll just kind of talk about the bouldering portion, but the bouldering portion was was won by kind of like a, a four-way tie between Colin Duffy, Sean Bailey, uh, Xander Waller, and Zach Gala. I think those were the four men, if I remember. I, I think they each topped three boulders at the Pan Ams or something like it, that. It wasn't and, a very useful bouldering round for the guys. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> but but I think, you know, we we kind of all expected Sean to, to crush. He's been on the circuit for years. Um, Colin Duffy, of course, anybody that had watched the national competitions – you know, leading up to that season, expected big things. After those Pan Ams, though, I was kind of excited to see what Xander Waller and Zach Gallo were going to do on the World Cup circuit, presuming they were going to do a bouldering, a, a full bouldering season, which obviously I'm, I'm not sure if they were at 2020. But just I remember watching those Pan Ams and thinking, oh, this is really interesting for Xander Waller and Zach Gallo. Like, I wonder, you know, I, I wonder what how they're going to do on the on the World Cup circuit this, you know, in a couple weeks or a couple months. Now. Beyond the Americans, though, I I think one of the big things that I wanted to see in 2020 was I wanted to see how Tomoa was going to do, because I think we have talked in the past about how he has the potential. If there's anybody that has the potential to to kind of do what Yanya is doing in the women's division, in the men's division, in terms of like just having this unquestionable dominance of of wins i think we've we've kind of both agreed that tomoa is the guy that could maybe do that um if anybody could and so i was thinking maybe 2020 would be tomoa's year to to give that a run and if he wasn't going to sweep everything maybe he would at least kind of win a majority of the 2020 bouldering uh competitions unfortunately that'll be a, a you know a question that we'll always be asking because we'll never be able to answer it because we lost the season but um Tomoa was a big uh, somebody that I was really looking forward to watching in 2020 I couldn't agree more like Tomoa was it, the you know the Tomoa Adam race which was which was really not that interesting I think they only overlapped at three of the competitions in 2019 like uh, Tomoa skipped two of them and I think Andra also skipped one or two um but yeah like it, it it's, I think it's been two seasons now since any man has won more than one World Cup bouldering event in a season. I think it was John Wan in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we talk, when you talk about men's bouldering, Tomoa is kind of like this dominant figure. He just seems like he must be better than everyone, but we've talked about in the past. He seems to make these mistakes every once in a while. And if you don't attend World Cups, you know, we can't really measure you. But I think his record in 2019 was he won one event and he came second in the other three events that he attended. So that's a pretty solid run. Now, imagine, you know, I, he recently started working with a new coach. Um, he's, you know, it's it's a weird year. But if you just look at his perspective, working with a new coach, had an incredible season where there was obviously room for like minor improvements would have made it one of the most dominant seasons uh, from a male boulder in a really long time. I think there is a huge potential there. And I think if, if you're him, I hope his coach is telling him like, this is who you can be, right? You can, you can do the Yanya thing. And like the men's side of the field is, is it's impossible or at least it looks impossible to be dominant. It seems like somebody wins every single time. But if you had to choose somebody, you would definitely say Tomoa because he's always right up there. Like if he attends, he's right up there and he's so close, literally in some events off by like a single attempt. And uh, so yeah. that's actually something I'm looking forward to this year, depending on whether or not he goes to all these events. I don't know. Maybe his Olympic scheduling will change, you know, how he's available. But let's, sorry. Let's say it's a shorter year. There's few events. You have the opportunity to maybe streak a season if you show up to all of them, especially if some other athletes don't. Like, you know, that's not going to be remembered. If you streak a season, people aren't really going to be remembering who didn't show up. So take the opportunity. Win them all. Like, let's go. Win Merrington 
and just keep it going from there. Yeah, and I think part of the reason why you and I have both keyed in to Tomoa is as the potential to have this kind of great, possibly, you know, totally uh, win win the whole circuit for a season is because all of he's when he's on he's he's so much seemingly better than than the rest of the field in a similar way to Yanya, right? Like when he wins, he often does it in very dominant fashion, and I think. When he doesn't, it it like you said, there are these little mistakes, and I think the sort of conventional wisdom has always been like, well, these little mistakes will get fleshed out in in time, right? He, he as he gets more more maturity, more experience on the circuit and whatnot, he'll just kind of like minimize those mistakes, and he'll really be able to put it all together at some point. Um, and so I I think for that reason, that's why you and I have both kind of thought that that it's only a matter of time till he can kind of put away all those mistakes and, and really kind of put it all together. Um, time will tell. It'd be great if he could do it this season, just because we saw how exciting it was when Yanya started doing it in 2019. It just adds this extra narrative for every single event. Uh, and it could be Tomoa's season. Certainly thought that 2020 could be. Yeah. It, uh, it, we'll see what happens. I was just going to look up cause I can't remember. He, I know he didn't win the Japan bouldering cup this year. Kokoro Fuji won it dominantly. And I'm starting to, was Tomoe even in the final? I can't even remember. So I'm not sure if he attended or not. That's, that would probably be really important context to this if I had bothered to, uh, to look at that. But yeah, a uh, uh, great point on Tomoe in general. Some other things that have recently come up, um, you know, looking into the season, it's going to be interesting who goes in the first place. And some people, aren't going to be attending an event because their country decided not to like in my case, Canadians aren't going. Uh, and that decision is out of their hands. It was kind of the, the Federation that decided that, um, you're going to have people that decide not to go on their own volition, like Shauna Coxie, who expressed her concerns, um, in an Instagram post a few, uh, weeks ago. And then, uh, Yulia Kaplin, I was speaking to earlier, just wondering if we were get to see her at any bouldering events. And some people just aren't attending because it doesn't fit their schedule. Um, uh, she mentioned that she's got a Russian championship that kind of conflicts with this World Cup, so she won't be at Maringen. She will be at as many speed World Cups as possible, but I was really hoping to see some of these, like, you know, uh, specialists, as we've referred to them, hopefully going to the other disciplines when they're Olympians, um, just to see what they look like. Uh, so the attendance is going to be uh, interesting to track, but most of the Olympians are going to be there. Um, but two of the people we mentioned, Sean McCall and Shauna Coxie, who won't be at this one, um, have have kind of mentioned some concerns around just whether or not it's safe. And, uh, you know, Sean just posted earlier today, we're recording this on Friday, um, that he's kind of expressed some some concerns around whether or not the best protocols will be followed. Uh, you know, if the protocols are written well, that's one thing, but whether or not they're actually um, uh, executed upon is is different. And I, I this is all speculation, but it's curious to see both the president, Sean McCall of the Athletes Commission and the vice president, Sean Coxie, uh, both of them showing a little bit of dissent and concern around the safety of some of these events. So I, I, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of those Athletes Commission discussions, those executive board discussions. Um, maybe there's a bit of a, a disconnect between how people feel about that, uh, that kind of safety. Um, mm -hmm. And Sean also bringing up the point, there might be some people that start traveling to one of these World Cups and then can't get across the border, which hopefully won't be the case. Hopefully every team has good managers that have done their work to, to make it happen. But um, yeah, you know, when I talk about attendance, step one is who registered. And there's a lot of people that didn't. But step two is who actually shows up, who can get into the country, who can pass the COVID test or whatever. So there's still a lot of uncertainty around that as well. Yeah, and with somebody like Sean or Shauna, you know, th 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 there's like this added layer of, well, they're getting ready for the Olympics, you know, and you so you wonder how, and so you have to think in the back of their mind, probably a big part of this is like, well, I want to stay healthy so I can continue training f for the Olympics, right? So you wonder just how things might be different if that, if the Olympics was not on the horizon uh three months or four months from now or whatever it is, uh, if, if their decisions might be any different, like you wonder how much the Olympic training is playing into it. I know in Sean's Instagram post, he said something like, I still, you know, I have my own gym here where I can keep training or something like that. Um, it's just another, it's just another layer to the whole thing, but obviously you and I aren't, aren't privy to kind of the inside 
uh, inner workings of any of the the protocols and all that. So um, can't really offer much except for to encourage people to go read the posts that were made by Sean and, and Shauna and, and the other people that choose not to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and props to the countries that made their announcements like publicly on their website rather than those where we had to like Instagram DM a bunch of athletes who don't have us added as friends and like, you know, probably don't even see our messages. It would be nice to know these things ahead of time. Right. Um, uh, so talking about going into the season, I guess, I guess the place to start is like what, what we're hoping for. And and we've kind of talked about a, a couple of those things to Mo and Arasaki being one, but I, I, an interesting one that we have to address is Yanya's potential to extend her season streak. And as mentioned before, you know, if we started, 20 or 2019 if we started that season saying somebody's going to win every single female bouldering world cup who would it be i don't think yanya would have been my first guess um, because again she you know she won that final world cup at the end of uh, 2018 she uh, won the world championship like that's all well and good but she didn't have the bouldering pedigree yet like that bouldering pedigree was really built in that last season of 2019 um, but she has the opportunity to extend it. And for some context, what what I think is interesting is she she already has not just the only person to sweep a bouldering season, male or female. Uh, it looks like she is, is the only person to sweep any season from any discipline. So that's awesome. Uh, but in terms of her streak, which currently stands at seven World Cups, and it's your choice if you want to add the two bouldering World Championships to that, you can measure it how you want. But her streak right now is seven World Cups, Um, from 2018 through 2019 and the two world championships, 2018 and 2019. So she has the option to extend that streak by a number of World Cups and maybe another world championships if the Moscow thing goes through, which I think it will. Um, And so a question that I had uh, for you, John, and just something to put out there is like, when you talk about somebody having a dominant period of form, the duration over which they have that dominance really it changes how you interpreted it. And so the example I would kind of give to people is let's say you have two athletes who have both won 10 World Cups in a row at some point in history, right? But then you find out that one of those people won all 10 in a single season. And then someone else, let's say Ayanya, won half of them in one year. And then two years later, after a break of no World Cups because of a pandemic, then won the next five. So you have somebody that won 10 in a single season and somebody that won 10 across two seasons with a huge year gap in the middle. Which one is more impressive, right? And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on on factors that would make one more or less impressive to you. Uh, it's a, it, this is a, it's a fun debate. It's a debate that you have in all of sports, right? What is What is better to get hot you know, in one period, one short amount of time, one season or whatever, or, or over a long period of time. Um, I think in the two examples that you gave and I, and I'll, I'll have some other things to add in a second, but I think just speaking about those two examples, 10 world cups, I think the more impressive would be to do it in a single season or, Mm -hmm. you know, or to do it consecutively in a single span, just because, um, just because to because every event then compounds kind of the 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 stakes compound on 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 itself sort of right like what you win one and then the the second one becomes even more important because you're keeping the streak going and then the third one becomes even more important and then the fourth one um and and also to just have everything align perfectly um in sort of an unbroken chain to never slip up to never make any mistake to to have the coaching be perfect to have the training be perfect to stay injury free uh to stay psychologically and emotionally sound for the for a for an unbroken period of events that to me is just incredible um and i think the proof kind of speaks for itself the fact that we've seen a number of competitors that have had success over you know here and there throughout the course of a couple seasons but there's only been one Yanya, right? There's only been one that has done it. Or maybe if you want to go back, I know we said maybe Robin Herbisfield did it in the 90s. But the point is, you know, it's like we're talking once every couple decades at most that somebody is able to do this. Um, so to me, in your example, probably doing it unbroken over a series of events would be more impressive. I have some other thoughts, but I want to get your uh, your, your opinion on your own question there first. Yeah, I so I'm I'm genuinely leaning the other way. Um and and that's based off of if you do it all in one season, you're probably competing against the same people that whole season. You're probably within the same um 
training cycle, right? Like you, you've peaked for the season and you did a great job of peaking and you get rewarded by like winning 10, you know, 10 World Cups in a go. But if, if you have to do it over multiple seasons, which means you have gone through multiple training cycles, like multiple rounds of peaking and starting over again, peaking, starting over again. You've also had, in this case, it's going to be like two years worth of new young athletes coming through so that the people you're competing against has like refreshed that may be good and bad you might have retirements of strong people but you also might have incredible young talent come up i think it's it's basically saying hey i i will kick anyone's ass at any time of day with any level of preparation and i i'm i'm thinking that is more impressive i think it's not as cool a spectacle of being able to say like 10 in a year but it, it kind of shows that you've been able to come back and match that peak after time off and all this uncertainty and stuff. And so, you know, the this is a hypothetical question because Yanya is already tied with the best streaks in climbing. Like she she only has room to go up. If she wins one more World Cup, she is the only person to ever win eight World Cups in a row. Nobody else has done that. Um, the only other contenders are, are in lead climbing. Um, and you mentioned, uh, uh one of them, Robin Herbesfeld Ravitu from 93 to 94. She won seven world cups in a row. Um, uh, Angie Eider has done it twice, which is an achievement on her own. She's won seven world cups in a row. One of those times with an additional two world championships, which is what Yanya has done right now. But again, this was in lead climbing for Angie. Uh, and then Jakob Schubert actually won seven in a row in 2011. So, so she's currently part of that club of seven World Cups in a row. Um, so if she wins Meringen, that's like that is a, an, another step in history is eight World Cups in a row. Um, she beats everybody on that particular metric at that point. So it is it is just a thing that I think about is, you know, like if if we if we gave her one more World Cup in um uh, uh, you know, if, if, if she got Maringen of 2020, I feel like that probably would have been an easier route to the eight win streak than it is now. Cause she's had to like do this multiple times. And I think that makes it harder for her. And, and as we'll talk about later, the threat of new talent coming up is very real, uh, this year. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that plays out, but those are my ideas. Did you have other, uh, other ideas it's, on that front? You know, you, you actually kind of said what I was going to say. I was, what I was going to say is I I think what is greater and what kind of the the whatever you want to say sports media considers greater and all that is the single the single isolated chain of of wins the single season sweep whatever you want to call it but to me personally what is more impressive um, is not when you're talking about necessarily the number of World Cup wins, like 10 or something. It's it's the duration. It's how long have they done it. So you compare what is more impressive, winning, you know seven World Cups or something in, in a couple seasons or even in, in one season or being near the top or at the top for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, something like that. And in that case, I actually think we agree on this. I, I think that that is, that is more impressive to be consistently at the top um, for, for, for that long precisely because if you're talking about 10 years, 12 years, you're talking about you, the person winning against their own generation, the competitors of their own generation. But then you're also talking about them beating competitors of the next generation, which is theoretically, just by nature, supposed to be better than them, right? Like that's mm. the whole point. That's how that's how history goes. The next generation is better than the one that came before it because they're learning from the generation, mm. right? So so they're they're presumably they they have better training they have better coaching they have better nutrition better facilities than than the generation that came before them so the fact that somebody would be able to win against their generation then beat the next generation and maybe even 12 15 years you know maybe even you're talking about beating the like the next next gen, next generation right the the beginnings of the third generation that is just mind blowing to me that somebody is able to that somebody would be able to do that. So um, as much as we can discuss it, I actually think you and I are in perfect agreement there. Yeah. So yeah, no one has won a Boulder World Cup except for Yanya Gar Garnbrett since when was the last time somebody else won? I'm trying to find the exact date for you guys. So it would have been June of yeah June of 2018 so almost three years the only person to have won a Boulder World Cup is Yanya Garnbrett, which is pretty cool. So we'll see. Yeah, if and I, it, that. 
and something that I would be very curious to hear from the the kind of statistician buffs that that would watch this is is what is the longest period in between World Cup victories? Um, you know, somebody wins and then like wins an event and then three years later, four years later, they win again or something like that. I would be very Even curious with other know. World Cups in between. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. I'd, I'd be I'd wonder if, for example, like somebody like Sean McCall, who's been on the circuit for a long time, you know, did he win like five years ago and then he wins one this season or something like mm. what is the biggest span of years in between two victories? That'd be that'd be fascinating to me because that plays into exactly what we're talking about, about beating people from, you know, multiple generations, potentially. I'm wondering if it's I'm wondering if um, I'll look it up for you. I'll try and find it out. And I'm, I'm really wondering if it's going to be obvious once I find it. I'm like, who, who could that possibly be? be that would have a have an unusual win i've got some ideas off the top of my head but i don't know for sure i it might correlate with like some of the older athletes on the scene i feel like it, if you find a really big streak but yeah so anyway the yanni thing's interesting uh the other thing i'm curious about is we saw you know a couple breakout names in the boulder season last year uh but then they like really broke out in the lead season so like a chai and so um, uh, uh, Natsuki Tani, all these people that, that were really killing it in the second half of the season. There's a lot of people just from one discipline or another who I would love to see what form they're in, uh, in, in bouldering now. Um, unfortunately, like the, the one I, I would love to see is I Mori, who, you know, had a, had a, a, a really good breakout season in bouldering in 2019. It wasn't, it wasn't shy and so level, but she came out of nowhere and, and I'm pretty sure earned a medal if I remember right. Um, she will not be at Maringen, unfortunately. So it's like kind of a, a moot point um, right now. But that's the that's kind of the other big story that I'm interested in is, are we going to see another year like 2019, which seemed so special by itself in terms of new athletes? Like I kind of looked back at the number of athletes in recent seasons that were in their like first year of eligibility that came on and did damage. There's honestly not that many of them. Like you, you look at even like Yanya's, breakout season in 2015 uh where she finished the like she finished in the in the lead rankings in seventh place across the whole season she earned a second a second and a third she didn't win any events if i remember right and she only competed in a lead uh, maybe she did one boulder event um, but like since then you get like ashima shiraishi and laura regora who both debuted in 2017 um but it wasn't really the debut in the kind of way that we saw at chai and so um, Futaba Ito in 2018, again, I think she had one particular good event, uh, in bouldering, but that was kind of it. Um, but then in 2019, it was freaking crazy, man. It was, it was these, the, these four, particularly these four, uh, young women from Asia who just like knocked the socks off everybody. Mm -hmm. And the question is like, can we do it again? Because this year we're going to have athletes born in 2004 for the first time who should have debuted last season. Um, some of whom did in Brianne Son, but that's kind of a forgotten competition. Um, and then, of course, 2005 as well. Um, and it, it's it's easy. It's interesting to like, let's not forget that it, we have lost a whole year. Right. And that's a long, long time for a competitor to be in peak performance. Like it's it, it almost mentally when we're thinking about it, it's almost like, well, Yanya did it. And so we'll see if she can do it again. It's like, no, well, she did it like two years ago. That is a long, long time. And, and to, to be able to j not just do it again, but to skip a year and do it again. I mean, that, that just underscores like the extra difficulty that she would be facing if she's going to try and sweep the bouldering circuit again. Um, the, the lost year in there. Yeah. It, 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 it would be a huge feat, especially with these, with these possibly kids coming up. And that's the part I don't know about, right. Is like, um, let's let's look back at the the lead world standings because I'm pretty sure Yanya had won the lead season three years in a row, leading up to 2019. Uh, yeah, she she won the season 2016, 17, 18, and then 2019. All of a sudden, some random kid out of Korea shows up and yoinks the four in a row from her, which would have been I think another record by itself. Um, a bunch of people have done three seasons in a row, but I'm pretty sure Yanya, no, sorry, uh, Robin Herbisfeld won four seasons in a row in lead in the early 90s. Um, but this would have put her on par with uh, Robin Herbisfeld. And you just have this kid who was not on really any of our radar um, doing a great job. So will it happen again? I would generally say no. I, I do think 2019 was an outlier um, because we haven't really seen those many breakout climbers all at once before, but that, that, part I can't really 
speculate on, although it's possible, is it might be the start of a new trend, right? It may be that climbing has just hit that year where the kids, you know, that came up in one of those first couple waves of bouldering or climbing or whatever are now hitting the age of being competitive. Uh, you know, the kids born in the early 2000s um, or mid 2000s. So you're looking at all of these gyms that were open in the 2010s or whatever. That's probably when they started climbing. That all starts to line up and you say, yeah, we might be hitting like the super cohort of climbers. Maybe there's, maybe it's the, it's the new change. Like I, I, in, um, uh, that video I did recently on the the average age of climbers, the one big outlier was in in female lead climbing, where the average age of semifinalist plummeted uh, because of these climbers that we're talking about. Um, and it might be a blip, or maybe it's the new normal, and we just got a sneak preview of it in 2019. Uh, I was kind of looking through world championship results for for youth climbers, which I normally don't do. Like I don't really. Yeah, when when a new climber bursts onto the scene at 16 in the Open World Cups, they've probably done pretty well at Youth World Championships, but it's like a single event once a year. It's only within your age group, so it's kind of hard to like predict whether or not an athlete who did a great job at like the Youth B Bouldering World Championships, whether or not they're going to be relevant on the World Cup season. But I decided to take a look just because of uh, of this situation. And there's a couple names who I'm sure will attend some of these World Cups. A lot of them are not attending because, you know, COVID's a, a mess. But the one that's interesting, partially because A, she is going to be at Maringen and B, because she like only wins youth competitions. She doesn't, she came second once. That was her worst IFSC event on record was a second place. Um, and that's Oriane uh, Bertone. I'm pronouncing it Bertone. It might be wrong. She's from France. Um, and she just wins events, man. Uh, she's on the French national team now. She's registered for Maringen and she's the only one that I would say um, maybe could look like somebody who uh, who makes a finals. Um, I would never say I expect somebody to win on their their first World Cup uh, considering who's going to be there but maybe she's kind of the the rebirth of like very serious French bouldering um, after Fanny Gibert has been hacking away at it kind of by herself for a little bit. Uh, maybe this is the the next person to come up. And again, born in 2005. Yeah. Yeah, that, it's it, that's the big question, right? Is how how smoothly will success on the youth circuit translate to the adult circuit? Um, it, it, history would tell us that it usually takes a year or two or, or more for, for the competitors who have been successful on the youth circuit to to kind of find their footing, no pun intended, um, and, and really perform at their level. I mean, even... Just the other day, I was watching a World Cup from uh, I think it was like 2015, and and it, Miho was climbing, and Tomoa was climbing too, and it was just interesting to watch them both kind of like struggling on these boulders and yeah. stuff. As as ba I mean, they look they were adults, but they looked like you know, or they were in the adult division, but they still looked like kids. Yeah, they were um, only like two years into it at that point or something. Yeah, and they were not, you know, they were coming into it with 2020 eyes and you expect them to just crush everything. And, and they, you know, they weren't, they were, they were kind of um, still getting used to the adult setting and, and, and presumably the magnitude of the events and, and just, they were still kind of growing up. And, and so you, it's unlikely that a competitor would rock through the youth scene and then rock, you know, immediately rock through the adult scene too. Um, but uh he, you know, every year that goes by, there's a new crop of kids coming up into the adult circuit that have had sort of like a more thorough, um, I don't know what you'd say, like m developmental process on the youth scene, just because coaching has been better, presumably, and all that stuff. So, 100%, yeah. 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 So, um, it, it, you know, it's it's not like it was years ago where you, you know, the youth scene um, you, you might've been sort of like self-coached and stuff. And then you enter the adult scene and you find your, your national team coaches and stuff. I, so I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious to watch that. Like you said, and, and there's some, some names that'll be fun to see. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you had any other talking points or if you want to move on to our, uh, our top three to watch. Well, the only thing I'll add about the Yanya thing is, is it's interesting to, to, to speculate also, and nobody can answer this except for Yanya. And I don't even know if I, Yanya would be able to answer it, but was, was to what effect, uh, sweeping the bouldering scene maybe had on her lead season and her lead performance in terms of just uh, the, the added expectations from everybody, the, maybe even the added sort of 
expect expectations on herself. I don't know um, of just kind of because remember after the bouldering season, after Yanya swept in 2019, the chatter was, oh, well, I, I wonder if she can sweep the lead season too. Totally. Yeah, and- that's, that's what's so messed up about it is if you had to pick like if, you know, Yanya was was proven as a lead athlete going into 2019. The bouldering yeah. was the surprise. So if she dominates bouldering, you have to say, wow, she got better. So it was extra shocking. And I don't think the fact that she didn't win those events was because she got worse. I think it's mostly that an incredible athlete came up yeah. out of nowhere. But but you are absolutely right. I'm curious what kind of mental pressure was there. Yeah, and the, the X factor, too, with Yanya in particular and a lot of the other athletes is their Olympic training, right? It, it, and this really hit home during the USA Climbing National Team trials that just happened in which the commentators kept saying over and over, like, the, the American Olympians who are participating in this, they're not – like they're not training to peak here and to win this event because they already have a spot on the national team. They're training to peak at the Olympics. You have to presume that it's, it probably will be similar for the, the people on the world cup circuit, people like Yanya. I would imagine again, I am not an authority here. I have no idea, but I would imagine she's training to peak at the Olympics, 100%. not training to peak at Mayringen or at on the world cup circuit. Um, so so her training might be a little different than it was in 2019, if not totally different, because presumably she's now training speed a lot more and, and, and all that stuff. So um, needless to say, it's not the same Yanya going into the 2021 bouldering season as it was Yanya going into the, the 2019 bouldering season for for a number of reasons. That's a, actually a really good point to bring up is that, number one, yeah, you have different priorities, but also why would you train for a boulder season where you don't even know – what events are going to exist and what don't like Maringen is going to happen. Salt Lake city is going to happen. Are they going to show up? I don't know. As of, you know, last night, Slovenia wasn't registered, um, which is fine. Cause it's, a, it's a while away. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And I think that becomes an interesting condition to consider if you have one of these athletes come up who are not going to the Olympics and they win, especially if they win narrowly over someone like Yanya, who, who, uh, who, you know, has, has history to make, but it pales in comparison to the, to the actual achievement of the Olympics later on. Um, and would maybe make an extension of her streak even more impressive because she doesn't really give a shit. Probably it's like, well, I'm sure she does, but it's down her list of priorities, presumably. Um, but yeah, again, the Olympics is a few months away. Like it is, it is still, uh, uh, April. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's possible that, yeah, you can fit in a few world cups here and there. If it's the only one that, you know, for sure you're going to, why not like go guns out for it, you know? So, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the, the thing to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Well said nothing to add. Uh, it, you know, I think, um, it's just all eyes are going to be on Yanya, certainly at the start of this season. Absolutely. Because, because of what she did in 2019. Yeah. For sure. Okay, let's uh, let's briefly for people uh, that are about to start watching the season, let's uh, let's give our the top three athletes that we are keeping an eye on uh, going into the 2021 Boulder season. I'll let you start. I we've kind of covered a couple of mine already, but whatever. Yeah, I, I you know uh, there are a lot of athletes that that I think I'm I'm excited to to watch. Um, but the one that I'll start with is a name that we've mentioned, which is Fanny G Bear. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I should say, I'm, I'm, tour? yeah, well, I'm guessing <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I didn't check. I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming she is on the registered list for Mayringen, although forgive me if, if she's not. Um, but maybe we should check that before I start talking about her. I'll check really quick, but keep talking because even well, if she's the, not, she might go to the U.S. one. Yeah. And, and even if she's not at Mayringen, just at some point this season, it's going I'm going to be really closely watching Fanny because I feel like the narrative for much of this past year, both in terms of the fans and, you know, you and I discussing it has just been how bummed we were that she missed out on that that Olympic spot. Not to take anything away from Julia Chanady or or Anna Jobert from France. Do you take a lot away from Anna Jobert? Like, you know, that's that's I think that like not her fault, not her fault. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think that was awful um, how the qualification ended up there by the way fanny is going to marry again okay and and so you know it's like this whole a lot of the narrative this past year for, around fanny has been just like oh it's so bad she's not going to the olympics we all feel bad we wish there was another spot for france or something like that because 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 fanny is a fan favorite and she's really fun to watch so i 
I wonder if she's going to be going into this World Cup season with, I don't know what you'd call it, like a, a sort of a chip on her shoulder or Foaming like something. at the mouth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think that she would want to say like, look, you know, you know, she was bummed about not getting that Olympic berth. She was very forthcoming in, in Instagram and stuff. So you, I wonder if she's going to be approaching this season like, hey, I want to prove that like you guys really messed up by not having me, you know, as that Olympian because I am the best French climber or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, I, I don't know. And, and so on top of how we enjoy watching Fanny anyway, um, because she's so good. It's like this added narrative of, yeah, like you said, like sort of vengeful Fanny G. Bear. Yeah, it's going to be great. I love it. That's a great story. Yeah. yeah. So add uh, add Stashy Gayo to that one. That's just mm. going to be the the one-two punch, just, you know, no mercy duo, just absolutely yeah. slaughtering. Yeah. Who else? Uh, another one I was going to say was Petra Klingler. Um, huh. and Because here's why. Petra is an – she's a fascinating case to think about because – we know she can be the best in the world, as evidenced by she won the 2016, I think, uh, World Championships in yeah. bouldering, right? So so she's capable of being the best of the best. And yet, if you look back at her, her past seasons, it it kind of feels like we like we never get a clear sense of exactly where she has stood since 2016. Um, the examples I wrote down was you look at 2018. As an, ex as an example season, she gets fourth in Moscow, then 13th in Meiringen. Uh, so very like, you know, up and down. And then she's not at Chongqing. She's not at Tai'an. She's not at Hachioji. She's not at Vail. Um, I, I don't remember if it was an injury. I'm, I'm guessing maybe there was some sort of injury there. Yeah, but the, you know, the point is, it's like she starts off and then she kind of, and then she, and then she just, you know, doesn't finish the circuit, unfortunately. And then you look at 2019, fifth in Meiringen. Eighth in Moscow, fourth in Chongqing, ten in Wujang. So again, it's kind of like a little bit of up and down. And then she's not at Munich and she's not at Vail. Um, so it's kind of a, unfortunately a, a sort of a repeat dance that we've seen. Uh, and then she injured her shoulder at the European Championships just like uh, in November 2020. Uh, so like, you know, she can be the best, and yet she's had these unfortunate circumstances and unfortunately we've been robbed of, of seeing, and she's been robbed of performing, but we've been robbed of just kind of seeing like how she is since 2016 under like a full season circumstances. So I, I'm really curious. I hope she stays healthy. She's of course really fun to watch. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll be curious. I'll be watching her. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting one. She's like, it's not a surprise to me that she made it to the Olympics, but she does feel like one of those, people that you know benefited from that particular event i don't consider her like a top definitely not a top five international boulderer right now and i'm not sure if she ever reached that because the that world championship kind of stood alone i think she's won one world cup in the past um so yeah i it's i i don't see her as one of those like i she's not somebody that i would ever place money on and making a final anymore i'm sure she can make one here and there but uh, yeah that's uh that's an interesting thing going into the olympics if that changes at all yeah and that's precisely my point because i think the same way i'm like well i don't know if i would consider her a top five but then i analyze it and i think well i wonder if the reason i i think that way is because she hasn't done a full circuit you know she because she does kind of have these start and stop uh, seasons, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. I'm at a loss for words other than I'm just really interested in seeing her. And I, it's like, I just hope we have a full Petra season. I just want to see her stay healthy for a full season to see, is to see if maybe you and I are wrong. Like maybe we should mm -hmm. be thinking of her in a top five and, you know, we've just unfortunate circumstances haven't allowed us to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally fair. And yeah. who's your third? My third would be a it's it's kind of a, a duo between uh, Mia Crample and Luka Rakovic because oh, cool. um, they, you know, they established this fascinating rivalry th that was kind of in place anyway, but it really solidified when they were both kind of vying for that other Slovenian Olympic spot. Um, and there's been some added press around it. I know here in the States, Ari Schneider uh, wrote a piece for the New York Times about their like friendship slash rivalry and stuff. Great piece. Um and, and I started to look at their results, and it's it's like it's interesting that Mia got the Olympic berth, and yet if you look at the the 
bouldering results, at least for 2019, I think Luca actually kind of had the edge. Um, Mayering in 2019, Luca is 16th, Mia's 29th. Uh, Moscow 2019, Luca is 4th, Mia is, again, 29th. Munich 2019, Luca is 8th, and Mia is 4th. So in that last one, Mia actually kind of came out on top. But the point is... There, there's just kind of like this, like jockeying for who's who's better between the two of them, and again, the fact that they're both friends makes it makes it uh, extra fun, and and so I'm just real curious to see how that rivalry plays out this season. Which of them kind of comes out uh, having the better bowling season after after all is said and done? Cool. I, I thought we were going to overlap a lot on our choices, but uh, but we didn't at all, as it turns I, out. So cool. Yeah. So anyway, I, my first one, which I don't think we've talked about yet, is uh, Akio Noguchi. Um, one of the greatest competition climbers to ever live incredibly long career. Um, I mean, she's, she's basically won a minimum of three Boulder world cup medals every single year since 2007. Like, what is that about? That's, that's wild. Nobody matches that. It's a debate whether or not she's the greatest Boulder, like female Boulder, uh, female competition Boulder in history. I personally don't think so, but she is certainly probably top three uh and and has an incredible career um and i think we'd all agree that this is probably her last season of competition um we've kind of heard uh murmurs that she might retire after the olympics so this might be it uh her final chance to like extend that legacy uh maybe snag another win um uh, so kind of looking forward to see how she goes out um see if there's much success um, the other one is Tomo Narasaki that we already talked about. I think he has a lot of opportunity this year, if only because, you know, the winds are just blowing in a particular way where things could come together to make an interesting season for him. Um, maybe not, but I'll always have hope that Tomoa will one day have like an incredible, really like a season that shows how dominant he really is with his talent. Um, somehow his talent all got soaked up in, you know, breaking the bait on the speed wall instead of being an unreal boulder. So I feel like he's a little bit misdirected recently. The one I was going to put in, but I, I'm not going to because she's not in Maringen, is I'm Mori. Um, I think she has the potential to be that, um, like, if Akio's heading out, I'm Mori's coming in. And Yanya's had her, like, five years or whatever of being the young gun. That's over. Aimori should be an amazing boulder based on the performances we've seen out of the Japan Boulder Cup and some other events. Um, I would love it if she ended up being that that incredible, like leading female Japanese boulder. I don't know what's going to what's going to go on with Miho, but, um, you know, she's had an injury in the past um, and and she's not the like the youngest kid on the scene anymore. So I hope Aimori is coming in to fill uh, Kyo's shoes. But again, she's not at the event. So instead, I'm going to say uh, who I mentioned before, Oriane uh, Bertone from uh, France. Um, I think if she attends more than one World Cup, I'd be interested to see how it turns out. Um, I try not to judge people off single events. So Maringen can go however it wants. She's never done a World Cup before. So not going to be too hard on her if it's a tough one but her youth record is sublime and uh i i think if you had to if you had to place a bet on a youth climber i think she'd be the one that you uh that you put money on because everyone else is um a little bit unproven whereas orianne has shown that she is absolutely the best female climber in europe in her particular age group which again is super narrow uh um narrow field to compete against but she dominates it so um yeah. yeah, anything can happen. I mean, the, the, it, it, we need to look no further than Mayring in 2019 with uh, Oceana McKenzie kind of coming, you know, coming out of nowhere, seemingly making a finals and stuff. So um, those are all stellar picks. I It's interesting that you mentioned like so many people from Team Japan, because it if we rewind back to 2019 it was the same kind of thing where we were expecting like oh it's only a matter of time till somebody on team japan uh you know overtakes yanya for that top spot at one of these bouldering events because if you'll recall it was like i think mao nakamura was in the fine close to winning at one point and i think futaba ito was close to winning at one point um and and if anything i we haven't had any indication in this pandemic uh, year that, 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 that there's any less of an assembly line of just Japan crushers coming up. If you, if people watch the Japan cup, it seems like they're just even more and more. So, um, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're Yanya, you wonder though, if that's going to maybe give her some extra motivation to know that 
you know, everybody's going to be kind of watching her. A lot of young people are going to be gunning for her because she, Yanya is to the point where she's she's got this iconic status where it's one thing to win a World Cup, but it's another thing like to beat Yanya to win a World Cup, right? Oh, like yeah. that's kind of what we develop. That's kind of what we saw with Che Yun So in in uh, in the 2019 lead season. It's it's like it's it's almost just this added story to anything to any victory. It's like you didn't just win a World Cup; you won by beating Yanya, who many people consider to be the the greatest of all time. Yeah. You know? Um. So yeah, which only adds to like the you know the dynasty of of Yanya is you know even if you don't win, you're still the story, right? Like that's that kind of proves how how uh, uh, you know how it really is the age of uh, of Yanya Garnbrett at the moment. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think I think the the Japanese team should look back at last season and say, "Oh, we only won a single bouldering gold medal in 2019. Aren't we supposed to be like the, you know, who has all the hype? It's Team Slovenia and Team Japan. Japan has done a better job of showing off that talent. I think their root setting uh, probably has more influence uh, on the scene right now, and I I don't know if that's just because of the particular root setters that they have going on in the circuit, or if literally their social media is just better, which is certainly possible, because that's basically what all climbing media is now, is just like, who's got the most popular Instagram accounts or whatnot. But Japan should be one of the dominant countries on uh, on the bouldering scene and they only got a single gold medal out of it last season they should be um fighting for more than that i think that's a disappointment on their part uh, so mm-hmm. i i think it makes sense that that uh, japanese athletes should be the ones to watch uh for the yeah. most part but yeah yeah so yeah, that's kind of my outlook. Uh, Maringen is going down this coming weekend. Uh, we are going to be watching uh, from the Discord. I think I'll be waking up god awful early to uh, to watch semifinals. Although my sleep schedule is just bad in general, so it probably doesn't matter. It's just like give it all up. I've got nothing to get to. I've got no haircut scheduled in the next <laughs> week, unfortunately. Um, we we at some point we have to do a John Bergman head turn so we can find out exactly how much hair is back. Oh yeah, part. it's. <laughs> it's, long. it's it's uh it's pretty pretty heinous yeah all right um so yeah if you're if you're planning on watching live uh join us in the discord the link is down below um we'll be doing it in voice chat if you're into that thing and there's also the text channel if you if you don't have a microphone or if you don't want to hear what uh, uh if you don't want others to hear what's going on in uh, in your house around you um as always thanks to the people that support us on patreon especially to the g5 so thanks for your support uh, if you want to get stickers like uh like this big boy um yeah you can uh, you can send us some money uh you can ask uh, your own questions on these shows all that kind of stuff uh and of course make sure you uh follow or subscribe to this channel give this video a like leave a comment if you're interested uh and uh, we will see you guys in just about a week after Maringen in the next debrief see you guys then